Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. If you have your Bibles in the adult class, let us go to the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter number 24 and verse number 32. Luke chapter 24 and verse number 32. The Bible says, and they said one to another, did our, not our heart burn within us? While he talked with us, by the way, while he opened up to us the scriptures. And they said one to another, did not our heart burn within us? While he talked with us, by the way, and while he opened to us the scriptures. We're going to be ministering this morning on Jesus preparing the disciples. Amen. Brother Reuben asked the blessing on the word of the Lord this morning, if you will. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for standing in the name of the Lord. Jesus prepared his disciples to carry out a mission because they had a purpose and a calling. And he prepared his disciples by teaching them, but not only by teaching them, but also modeling the principles of the kingdom of God and of the scripture by the life that he lived. And the Bible tells us in 1 Peter that he left us an example that we ought to follow. And if we are going to be prepared to be a vessel and to be an instrument so we can carry out, amen, the kingdom of God in our midst, that we can be a lighthouse, we can be a soul winner, we can be a soul-saving station, amen, then we have to follow what the Lord has laid down before us. We have to begin to indulge in the Word and begin to live in the Word. And when we yield ourselves to Jesus Christ, he will prepare us through the teaching of the word as well as by the spirit. The Bible says in the book of Ephesians chapter 4 and verse number 11, and he gave some apostles and prophets, amen, some evangelists and some pastors and teachers. He gave some apostles and prophets, evangelists, pastors and teachers. Why did he give us the fivefold ministry? For the Bible says in verse number 12, for the prophetic of the saints, amen, for the work of the ministry that God has called each one of us to do, and for the edifying of the body of Christ. So the ministry has been given to us to teach us the word, to share with us the word, to expound the word to us, amen, for our perfection that we would grow, we would mature, we would develop into what God wants us to mature and to develop into. But not only that, but yet for the work of the ministry for the edifying of the body of Christ. As you have heard me say many times, amen, over the past year or so, each one of us has a ministry. Each one of us has talents and abilities that if we will yield ourselves, God will take us and God will flow through us that we will be able to reach someone. We will be able to be a light and we will be able to be a witness, amen, for somebody's life and someone's heart that they can begin to experience what you and I experience, and they can begin to know what you and I know. So you say, well, Brother Yusupan, how long will this take place? How long uh, of, of time will this take place? Well, verse 13 gives us the answer, till we all come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So God is going to work within us. God is going to deal with us until there is a unity of the faith, amen, that we, our minds and our hearts are on the word of God and we believe it and we really know who he is, not just with a head knowledge but with a heart knowledge, amen. I know Jesus Christ in a great and real mighty way until the perfect man, until we are made complete, till we are made that vessel, amen, that God wants us to be and that's not going to happen until the rapture of the church or until 
until we pass away, until the end of our life, amen, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. So everything that we hear, amen, through the ministry of the word, through the operation of the word, by the fivefold ministry, it is to develop us, it is to mature us, it is to make us, amen, to walk and to become like the fullness of Christ, that his glory and his power will be shown within us. In fact, Jesus said this in John 16 and 13, how be it when he, the spirit of truth is come, of course, that's the Holy Ghost, he will guide you into all truth, amen, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. So the Holy Ghost, the spirit of God, compounded and combined with the word of God is going to lead us into all truth, but we have to be willing that I am going to yield myself to walk in that truth. I am going to have to be willing to follow that truth. I am going to have to be willing to give myself to that truth. Amen. So I can become the disciple. I can become the instrument. I can become the child of God that God wants us and wants me and wants you to be. Early in the ministry of Jesus Christ, he sought out, amen, men to whom he can teach the principles of the kingdom of God. And he's still searching for individuals, men and women, that will say, God, I will be a vessel. I will be an instrument. I am willing, Lord, to yield myself. I am willing, Lord, to surrender myself. I am willing, Lord, to give myself totally and completely to you. Amen. And for that to happen, we have to change our way of thinking. Did not the apostle say in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, amen, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present yourselves as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Verse number one. Verse number two says, and be not conformed to this world. Don't be molded. Don't be shaped by this world, but by the tra transformation, by the renewing of your mind. So our thinking has to change, and it's only going to change when we give ourselves to what the Word of God says, and we allow the Spirit of God to flow across us. Amen. Someone made this statement and how true it is. The mirrors must be finely polished. Amen. The mirrors must be finely polished that are designed to reflect the image of Christ. We cannot allow flaw. We cannot allow, amen, dirt or smudges to be on our heart and upon our life if we are going to reflect the image of Christ. We have to finely polish ourselves and to examine ourselves, amen, to see if the world sees Jesus Christ with inside of me and nothing else. And so for this to happen, the disciples had to remove and forget their preconceived ideas that they had, how things might all to be. Amen. They also had to remove, amen, their ideas of advancement. You remember the two brothers, amen, that wanted to sit on the right hand and on the left hand of Jesus Christ by the request of their mother. And Jesus said, this I cannot give unto you. So we've got to remove our ideas. We have to remove our thinking. You know, as far as what we think and about advancement and prestige in the kingdom of God, Lord, I just want you. Lord, I want to be a vessel. Lord, I want to be willing to you. So wherever you would have me to go, whatever you would have me to do, Lord, that should be our heartbeat. That should be our prayer. And so we got to allow this to happen if we are going to be used for the master's use. Amen. And we need to hear the message of the kingdom, not only with our ears, but with our hearts and our minds that we allow the words of God to penetrate our hearts and our minds, allow the word of God to minister to us, amen, with the power and the authority so it will allow faith to grow, it will allow a faith to mature, it will allow faith to develop with inside of us, and yet also, amen, as that happens, we can give hope and we can give help to those that are weak and to those that are helpless. We live in a world today where people are hopeless. We live in a world today where people are looking for help and as we yield ourselves and we surrender ourselves to God, amen, we will see God use us. We will see God take us. We will see God move through us in a mighty way that we will be able to reach the person that seems at the bottom of the ladder. We will be able to reach the person that's at the bottom of the pit. We will be able to reach the person, amen, amen, the 
give them hope of life and give them hope of something greater than what they have. Even though they may never accomplish much as far as the world is concerned and materialistically and possessions, but yet to have a greater hope of salvation, to have the greater hope of the peace of mind, to have the greater hope of the joy of the Lord flowing with inside of you. That is the best thing that we can offer somebody and somebody say amen. And as we go through life, as we live for God, amen, and and both messages that we're going to be ministering here, the Sunday school lesson and also the second service, amen, just once again go hand in hand one with another, amen. And so it will, we will understand why things happen. We will understand why we go through things in a greater way, and we will see the hand of God in each and everything. But part of the preparation of the disciples was not only hearing the words. Part of the preparation of the disciples was not only following Jesus and seeing the miracles, but yet part of the preparation that the disciples had was being involved in trials and tests. Amen. And as they went through the trials and tests, and as they walked with God and had fellowship with Jesus Christ, when they faced the storms, amen, and when they came out under the other side, Jesus would give them words of instruction. Jesus would give them words of correction, and Jesus would also give them words of rebuke if it was necessary. Why? Because Jesus was molding and Jesus was shaping the heart and mind of his disciples. And so as we live for God, and as we serve God, and we become prepared for the master's use, yes, we will face the trials, and yes, we will face the storms, and yes, we will face the situations, but if we know the word of God, and And when we come into the house of God and we remain sensitive to the word of God, God is going to give us correction. God is going to give us rebuke or God is going to give us instruction. Amen. How we can better prepare ourselves when we have come out of that trial and test. Or on the other hand, he will give us a high five and say, job well done. You've learned the lesson. You've trusted in me. You held on to my hand and you did not allow the pressure. You did not allow the trial and you did not allow the situation, amen, to separate yourself from me. So this is how Jesus prepares us. This is how Jesus ministers to us. This is how Jesus gets us ready for something greater and something more wonderful so we can be prepared. We can be the vessel and we can be the instrument for someone. An example of this is found, and you know this parable or this scripture, amen, because Uh, I preach from it quite often, Mark chapter 4, beginning with number 34. And the Bible says, but without a parable spake he not unto them. And when they were alone, he expounded all things to his disciples. So as Jesus ministered to the people, he spoke in parables. But yet, when he was alone with his disciples, he expounded on the parables. Amen. So they would learn the meaning of the parable. So they would have understanding and instruction. And so the Bible goes on to say, in verse number 35, and the same day during the time, right after during the time of teaching, during the time of ministry, the Bible says, and the same day when the evening was come, he said unto them, let us pass over on the other side. And the Bible says, and when he sent uh, away the multitude, they took him even as he was in the ship, and there was also with him other little ships. Verse number 37, and there arose a great storm of wind, and the we, we, the waves, excuse me, beat into the ship so that it was now full. And the Bible says, and Jesus was in the hinder part of the ship, asleep on a pillow, and they awake him and shut unto him, Master, don't you care that we perish? Now, what they should have understood was Jesus said, let's go to the other side. And if Jesus said, let's go to the other side, it does not matter what happens from point A to point B. Jesus is going to take care of them. Jesus is going to see them through. Jesus is going to make sure they arrive safely. But yet between point A and point B, after they heard the word of God earlier that day, there was going to be a time of testing. There was going to be a time of trial. There was going to be a divine intervention, amen, that the Lord was going to use this time to strengthen his men, to strengthen his people, to guide them and direct them so when they face a situation like it down the road, they'll know what to do since they 
missed, amen, the spiritual application from the Word of God before. How many times do we face the same thing over and over and over and over again? Well, could it be the reason we face the same thing over and over and over again? Because we have not learned the application of Scripture. We have not learned to trust Him. We have not learned to lean upon Him. We have not allowed Him to work within us and to move through us. Amen. And so just as it is with school, you've got to get, you've got to learn the application of the material if you want to advance into the next grade. But if you don't learn the material, amen, you are not going to go to the next grade. And somebody say amen. I, I remember this from, you know, personal um, life when I entered into high school in, in ninth grade. I, I just had a, I had a carefree attitude. I, I didn't care. You know, I really didn't care what happened. And the first semester, I only passed three courses. That was pre-algebra, that was band, and maybe only passed two. Maybe I failed the other four courses. Amen. But I remember when I got my, my, my report card, and I only saw that I had a half a credit, and I needed 18 to graduate, amen, from high school. I said, you know, I, I've got to turn this situation around. And so the second semester, you know, I, I cracked down, and I started behaving myself, amen, and so I passed every subject. But yet, because I failed literature, amen, in the first semester of the ninth grade, even though I made it to the 10th grade, and passed, I still had to take ninth grade literature again as a sophomore. And you talking about embarrassing? Here was a sophomore sitting in a freshman class of literature because when I was in freshman class of literature, I didn't want to learn Romeo and Juliet. I thought it was stupid. I thought it was a waste of time. I thought, you know, I could just be involved with something better. But the school system didn't think so. Amen. And so there are times that we've got to repeat ourselves over and over and over again because we don't learn. Amen. We will not apply ourselves. We will not yield ourselves. We will not surrender ourselves. Amen. To the Word of God, to the Spirit of God. And so Jesus taught his disciples. The storm came. He was in the back of the boat. And the disciples said, Master, don't you care that we perish? Amen. That should not have been the words out of their mouth, but it was because they did not learn. And so the Bible says in verse number 39. And he arose and rebuked the wind and said unto the sea, Peace be still. And the wind ceased and there was a great calm. So Jesus did just what Jesus does. He brought peace. He brought calm. Amen. In the midst of the storm. And the Lord will do that same thing for you and me. But the Bible doesn't stop there. Look what he said in verse number 40. He said unto them, Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? And just earlier that day, he taught them the word of God. He taught them and expounded, amen, the parables, and he did this constantly. But somewhere, the disciples did not get it in their heart. Somewhere, the disciples did not get it in their spirit. And so when they faced the storm, and they faced the trial, and they faced the test, they flipped out. They lost it. They became afraid. Jesus said, why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? So when we go through the trials and we go through the test, if we know the word of God because we have listened to the word that has been preached to us, and we have allowed the word to be planted within our spirit. We have allowed the word to be planted within our heart. And we have been sensitive and we have yielded ourselves to the Holy Ghost. Even though we face the storm, even though we face the trial, even though we face the test, we know that God's going to take care of us because God has told us to go from point A to point B. And if God tells us to go from point A to point B, then we can have faith and we can have assurance we're going to get on the other side. Even even though there may be an interruption, even though there may be a storm, I know I'm going to make it. Amen. I know I'm going to see the other side because God is preparing me and God is shaping me. Somebody say amen. So these things happen to you and me. 
Amen. The, the word of God comes after a trial and after a situation. And it may come as a congratulatory, amen, remark. Or it may come as, as correction to show us our error. Or it may come as instruction or it even may come as a rebuke. Why are you so fearful? How is it that you have no faith? Can you not trust me? And the Lord is not telling us that to make us feel bad. But he's trying to put his spirit, he's trying to put his word with inside of us that we can be the vessel, we can be the instrument prepared for the master's use. So when we're outside the four walls of our home, we're outside the four walls of our church, God can use us in a great and mighty way to reach someone that needs help, to show someone the truth, to show someone the way, to show someone the power of God. Everybody say amen. Also, not only did Jesus use trials and tests, but part of the preparation involved acting on faith. In other words, if I, as I said the last few services, amen, that we believe the word. We speak the word. We live the word. We put the word in practice. And we see this in the Gospel of St. John, chapter 6 and verse number five, number 5. Now, when Jesus lifted up his eyes, he saw a great company come unto him. And he said unto Philip, When shall we buy bread that these may eat? Where are we going to find groceries to feed these people? And the Bible says Jesus said this, amen, to prove Philip, for he knew, amen, what he would do. Sometimes Jesus will ask, Ask us a question, amen, to a situation that seems to be impossible and improbable, and he wants, us, he wants us to respond to him, amen, so that we can see where our faith is. We can see where our trust is. And so this is what Jesus did with Philip. And Philip answered him and said, well, you know, Lord, we've got a situation here. We've only got 200 penny worth of bread. This is not enough, amen, to feed 5,000 men, not including the women and the children, amen. And then verse number 8, the Bible says, and one of his disciples, Andrew, amen, said unto him, there is a lad here that has some, uh, a small lunch. He has five barley loaves and two small fishes, but what are they among so many? How is this little boy's lunch going to meet the need of 5,000? Amen. But Jesus has a greater plan, and so Jesus will speak to us the word. He will give us the word, amen, so that we should act upon it, and we should live it. We should speak it. We should profess it and put it in the action. And so Jesus gave them the answer. He said, this is what we're going to do, gentlemen. He said, you make everybody sit down. And there was much grass in the place. So the men sat down in number of about 5,000. And the Bible says, and Jesus took the loaves, and when he had given thanks, he distributed it to the disciples, and the disciples to them that were set down. Amen. And likewise of the fishes as much as they would. And then the Bible says, and they were filled. Look what he said. And they were filled, and he, Jesus said to his disciples, gather up the fragments that remain, that nothing be lost. Therefore, they gathered them together and filled the 12 baskets with the fragments of the five loaves, amen, and remained over and above unto them that had eaten. So Jesus prepares us by the word of God. We may not be able to see. We may not be able to understand. But when Simon or Andrew bought the lad with the lunch, amen, and Jesus said, make them to set down in their numbers, they obeyed the word of God. Amen. And God took what they had and multiplied it upon the crowd that was there that day. I'm here to tell you, when Jesus speaks to you the word of God, don't question it. Don't doubt it. But but yield yourself to the word of God and watch Jesus take it. We'll watch Jesus multiply the blessing. Amen. And when it's all said and done, you are going to be full just as the people were that, were that day. Amen. God will supply your need. God will make a way where there seems to be no way if we will just hear, if we will just yield, and if we will just surrender to what the word of God says. But we miss out on so many blessings 
Because when we hear the word of God or God speaks into our spirit, God speaks into our heart, amen, we will not give ourselves to it lest we are afraid, amen, well, that's just myself. You know, that's just my wishful thinking, amen. And then we miss out on the miracle. We miss out on the blessing that God has for each one of us. So we need to be willing. We need to be able to surrender ourselves to the call and to the purpose of Jesus Christ. The reason reason that Jesus spent so much time with his disciples was to prepare them, to get them ready, amen, for their calling, amen. And Jesus constantly deals with you and me. That's why it is imperative we're in the house of God every time that we can, because we are going to receive instruction. We are going to receive the word. We are going to see the hand of God move and operate within our life if we will yield ourselves and if we will surrender ourselves to him. And so when we miss that chance to be there, when we miss that chance, amen, to yield ourselves, when we miss that chance to hear the word of God and worship God and allow the spirit of God to minister to us, we are missing on a chance that the word of God will flow within our spirit and flow within our heart and flow within our mind. And somebody say amen. My wife was telling me of a situation concerning her home church that her mother, amen, told her. Amen. The last several weeks, amen, they, they, their attendance has increased. A lot of old people have started coming back, and now they're running in the mid 350s somewhere around there, a good number on Sunday morning, close to 400 on occasion. But on Thursday night, they have less than 60 there. Something's wrong with that picture. Something's not right with that picture. Amen. Uh, they, they just, they come on Sunday, that's good, but yet they also need to be there on the, the midweek service to hear the word of God. And so it's the same with you and me. Every time that we come, we need to be prepared. We need to surrender ourselves to the will and to the purpose and to the plan of God. The next thing that Jesus Christ did to prepare his disciples was through prayer. Everybody say prayer. Amen. Jesus wanted to prepare his disciples, amen, with the spirit and with the element of prayer. And so we need to ask ourselves, do we have the prayer life that God wants us to have? Amen. You read in the bulletin this morning, the pastor's corner, amen, what I told Melissa several times about prayer. We need to develop a life of prayer because with Jesus, prayer permeated everything. Before he started his ministry, what did he do? He spent 40 days in prayer and fasting. And as you read through the Gospels, there were several times that the Gospel writers recorded that Jesus went alone to pray. Why? Because Jesus realized the importance of prayer. And we need to realize the importance of prayer. And you know, we just don't pray. We just don't have time to pray. But we need to understand that we have to take time to pray because there are so many things Amen. That can get in our life. There are so many things that will pop up that unless we have a set time to pray, amen, unless we have a set time that I am going to seek God, I am going to love God, I am going to give myself to God, amen, we're not going to have that time. Now, I want to ch challenge each one of you here today, and I, I may preach on this maybe next week. I, I don't know yet. But I, I want to challenge each one of you. Amen. Do you study your Bible and do you pray on a regular and consistent basis? Amen. And this, this, this what I'm going to leave with you is, is not original. I heard someone else mention this and I wrote down, amen, what they said and I thought it was good. This is what I want you to do. If you do not have a consistent prayer life, if you do not consistently read the Bible, what I want you to do for the next 30 days, the next 30 days, Discipline yourself. And the reason why I say discipline yourself is because you're going to have to make yourself do it. But the next 30 days, I want you to take at least 30 minutes a day and spend time in prayer and spend time reading your Bible. you got to make yourself 
do it. Amen. And if you will discipline yourself, amen, to do this over the next 30 days, at the end of the 30-day mark, you're going to see some changes in your life. And then the following 30 days, amen, after you discipline yourself, then you are still going to continue doing this, taking at least 30 minutes a day, preparing yourself, amen, yielding yourself and surrendering yourself to the Word of God, and then you're going to give yourself to Him amen, that the Spirit of God will flow through you, the Spirit of God will minister to you, and then you're going to, amen, bless yourself, amen, and you're going to continue looking into the Word of God. Now, because you have disciplined yourself for the first 30 days, it's not going to be so hard, amen, to do the second 30 days. And when you come out of the second 30 days or at the end of 60 days, you're going to see greater changes in your life. Then I challenge you to go 30 days more, so for a period of 90 days. And the last 30 days, you're going to delight yourself in God. Amen. So not only are you looking forward to it, not only has it become a good habit to have, but yet the last 30 days, you're going to begin to delight yourself. You're going to have that desire. You're going to have that hunger. I've got to seek God today. I've got to love God today because I delight myself. I am enjoying the blessing of God. And at the end of those 90 days, you you are going to see such a tremendous difference in your life, amen, that it has become part of your fiber, it has become part of you, amen, that you're not going to miss prayer, you're not going to miss studying the Word and putting the Word of God in your life, amen. And then when you face the trials and you face the tests and you face the heartaches, guess what? You're going to have Scripture come back to your mind. You're going to feel the Spirit of God speak to your heart because you have tuned your heart, you have tuned your mind. Amen. To the presence and to the Word of God. And you know that God's going to take care of you. And somebody say amen. And so one of the things that Jesus taught about was prayer. Amen. And, and because he taught upon prayer and showed prayer so much to his disciples, the Bible says in Luke chapter 11 and verse number 1, amen, and it came to pass that as he was praying in a certain place, when he ceased, one of his disciples said unto him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John also taught his disciples to pray. So they saw it. They heard the word of God. They saw the difference that it meant, and it created a desire within inside of them that, Lord, teach us to pray. Amen. And so he laid the groundwork, and I'm going to hit on that in just a moment. Amen. About prayer. True prayer. Everybody say true prayer. And when I speak about true prayer, I'm not talking about just a little routine. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. And if I wake, um, whatever, how it goes, amen. God bless my brother Jake. You know, you know the little prayer. Amen. But true prayer is that prayer that touches God, that true prayer. And the effectual prayer is that prayer that God loves. Amen. For the Bible says, and I, I don't have the scriptures here in James chapter 5 and verse number 15, the Bible says, confess your faults one to another. Amen. And pray for one another that you may be healed. The effectual fervent prayer, James says, of a righteous man availeth much. So we have that prayer, and it has become more than routine. But yet I am touching the heart of God. I am touching the throne room of God, and it has become an effectual prayer. It has become fervent prayer. It has become a prayer of fire. It has become a prayer of passion. And when this happens, amen, I am touching God and something is going to happen. And so this is why Jesus said in Matthew 7 and 7, ask and it shall be given you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it shall be opened unto you. You say, well, brother, you saying I did ask. I did seek. I did knock. Nothing happened. How long did you ask? How long did you seek? How long, that, how long did you not? Because true prayer is not going to quit until the answer comes. For the Bible says, for everyone that asketh, what? receiveth, and everyone that uh, seeketh, uh, it receiveth, or he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh, it shall be open. So I am going to ask, I am going to seek, and I am going to knock until it 
comes to pass or God says wait a little bit or God says no. But I am not going to get discouraged. I am not going to quit because I don't see it happen right away. Amen. This is how the Lord develops us. This is how the Lord shapes us. This is how the Lord increases our faith to make us the vessel and the instrument that he wants us to be so we know that when we do pray, God does answer. Amen. And the answer is on his way. But I'm I'm not going to stop because I don't see it right now. Everybody say amen. So true prayer pleases God. True prayer involves persistence. Everybody say persistence. Amen. And it came to pass that as he was coming nigh unto Jericho, the Bible says a certain blind man sat by the wayside begging. And then verse number 36, and hearing the multitude pass by, he asked what it meant. Verse number 37, amen, and they told him that Jesus of Nazareth passeth by. And so when he heard that Jesus passed by, what did he do? Verse number 38, and he cried. He lifted up his voice, Jesus, Jesus. And he just didn't sit there and say, uh, sir, um, um, I, I'd like to get your attention, please. No, he cried out. He said, Jesus, thou son of God, have mercy on me. And then the Bible says in verse number 39, and they which went before rebuked him, amen, that he should hold his peace. But he cried so much the more, thou son of David, have mercy on me. You understand what he's saying? Amen. He began to cry out to God, Jesus. And the people said, shh. Calm down now. You don't have to get all excited. Amen. You're really not that important. Amen. There's other people here that need the attention of the master. Just calm down. He's not going to pay attention to you. He's not going to have anything to do with you. Sort of like what the devil whispers in our ear. God's not going to answer your prayer. But you know what Bartimaeus did? He said, uh-huh. I'm going to show y'all. Jesus! And he raised his voice and he cried, amen, cried from the depths of his heart, have mercy upon me. There's got to be a persistence in our spirit. There's got to be a persistence in our heart that I am going to touch Jesus. And so when Jesus heard the persistence, he stood still and commanded him to be brought unto him. And when he was come near, he asked him, saying in verse number 41, what will thou that I should do unto thee? And he said, Lord, that I might receive my sight. And Jesus said unto him, receive thy sight. Thy faith has saved thee. What was his faith? It was more than just saying, I believe Jesus can heal me. But his faith also encompassed a persistence. It encompassed a, a, a determination. It encompassed a fervency. Amen. An effectual prayer. A prayer from the heart. Jesus, have mercy on me. He was not going to be sidetracked. He was not going to listen to the crowds of the people because he needed a touch of God. And when we pray and we want God to develop us and mature us, we'll hear all kind of things that try to quiet us down, try to settle us down. Amen. Just, you know, Jesus is not going to have anything to do with you. You know, you, you failed him too many times. Your prayer is not going to be answered on and on and on again. But that ought to give us a persistence that I am not going to let go until I get what I need from God. And so Jesus prepares us, amen, through the model of prayer. And he shows us, amen, that persistence is an important part because that persistence is actually our faith in action. More than just saying, I believe. More than just saying, I know to come to pass, but there is that persistence. I'm going to continue bombarding heaven. I am going to ask, amen, and I'm going to ask until I'm given it. I'm going to seek until I find it. And I'm going to knock until the door is open. How many of us have that determination? How many of us have that faith and that zeal? If you don't, that's why I want you to pray for 30 days. Discipline yourself. I am going to put the word of God. I am going to pray. I'm going to make myself do it. And then the next 30 days, you know, I, I, I'm just going to continue to do it. I had to discipline myself, and now I, I'm going to just enjoy myself. And then the last 30 days, I'm going to delight myself in this, and I'm going to let it become a part of my life. It's imperative that we have a prayer life. Everybody say amen. 
I believe it was the last Sunday of December, I was mentioning a little bit about the Lord's Prayer. And I said this, and I want to share with it again, share with you it again. After this manner, the Bible says, Therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Verses 9, 10, 11, and 12, and verse 13 is known as the Lord's Prayer. And a lot of people say, well, let us pray the Lord's Prayer, and they will repeat these words. Now, there's nothing wrong with praying Scripture, okay? There's nothing wrong with praying Scripture. But I want you to know that this was not the intent of the Lord. It was not the intent of the Lord just for you to repeat the Scripture and say, well, I just prayed the Lord's Prayer. No, the Lord's Prayer, the intent and the purpose and the meaning of it is something greater. So Jesus said, after this manner, therefore pray ye, our Father which art in heaven. What is this? Amen. Hallowed be thy name. Amen. As we begin to develop a life of prayer and we mold a life of prayer within our lives, the first thing that we are going to incorporate is praise and worship unto God. We recognize how awesome he is. We recognize how majestic he is. We recognize how wonderful God is and that he is my father and I am his child. So we spend time in praise. We spend time in worship glorifying God. What does this do? This gets our mind and this gets our heart in the place, in the framework that I say, hey, I know how God great is. And because I know how God great is, then I can begin to move in the operation of prayer. Then verse number 10, the Bible says, Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. This is the element of submission. Once we recognize how awesome God is and I, I praise him and I worship him and I recognize that I've got to put myself in the proper place then I can submit myself to God. I can yield myself to God. Lord, I want your will to be done in earth, speaking about us, the earthen vessels, as it is in heaven. In other words, I give myself to you. I surrender myself to you. I yield myself to you. Amen. So your will can be done. But if we don't give ourselves to the will of God, then the will of God won't be done. Amen. So we yield and we surrender. Amen. Thy will be done. So we submit ourselves to God. After we submit ourselves to God, then we can bring our prayer requests to the Lord. Give us this day our daily bread. And the reason why we have to submit ourselves to God in actuality before we bring our prayer requests to the Lord, amen, because otherwise we may pray erroneously. We may pray Amen. Foolishly. Amen. But when we submit ourselves, we're praying according to the will of God. And when we pray according to the will of God, we know that the Lord hears our prayer and we know the Lord answers our prayer. So give us this day our daily bread. Amen. This shows us here in Scripture that prayer needs to be a daily part of our life. Give us this day our daily bread. Amen. As you know anything about early history, Bible history, early times, amen, they didn't have refrigerators. So what did they have to do? Every day they had to go to the marketplace if they were going to eat. Every day they had to go to H-E-B or Walmart and buy groceries. Thank God for refrigerators, amen? Thank God for cabinets so you don't have to do that every day. But Jesus knew, and we need to know and understand, every day I'm going to pray that God will supply my needs. And then after that, we look at ourselves in the form of self, amen, examination, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Amen. And we're, and, and we're saying, God, don't lead us into temptation, but how is God not going to lead us into temptation that we don't yield ourselves into temptation? We don't walk in the ways of temptation. So I examine myself. I, I look at myself. Amen. God, lead me, amen, not into temptation. Amen. Verse number 11, praise God. Give us this day our daily bread. Amen. Verse number 12, praise God. And I got, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Amen. We repent, we forgive, and we are thankful. Then we go into self-examination. Excuse me. Amen. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And then the last thing, amen, is praise and worship once again. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So the model of the Lord's prayer is praise and worship. It's submission. It's prayer requests. It's repentance, forgiveness, and thankfulness, self-examination, and then praise and worship again.
So as we reflect on these six areas of prayer, it will help us develop, amen, a balanced approach in prayer so we can allow God to use us and to develop us to be the individual that God wants us to be. And everybody say amen. amen. I'm out of time. Amen. So we're going to have to end right there. But God wants to develop you. God wants to develop me. God wants to prepare you. God wants to prepare me so we can do the calling, we can do the work, and we can do the purpose of the kingdom. And everybody say amen. Let's clap our hands and thank the Lord for his word right now.